Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. I am your host, Xavier Snow, Program Coordinator for the Greater Washington Urban League's Contact Tracing Awareness Program. Our goal is to provide the Black community with information on COVID-19 so that they can protect themselves during the pandemic. Today, I have the good fortune of sitting down with an intelligent, supremely wonderful, and hardworking woman by the name of Dr. Yolanda Hancock. How are you doing today, doctor? I'm doing well, my love. Thank you for that intro. You made my heart just jump for joy. How are you? I am 100%. I'm, I'm glad to have you. Uh, now Thank for those, you. Absolutely. For those of us who may not be familiar with your work, can you please just tell, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. So I am both a pediatrician and an obesity specialist. I help people lose weight and manage chronic disease really through nutrition. I try to keep my prescription pad in my desk as often as I can and using food as medicine. That's one of the hats that I wear as a clinician. The other hat that I wear is as a public health shero. My goal is to not only be out advocating and showing up for rallies and protests, but also influencing health policy and serving as a conduit of information for my community, whether it be in the midst of this pandemic or other public health issues. Absolutely, absolutely. That's that's wonderful. So obviously the Black community is the hardest hit by this pandemic. A large part of that has been due to our lack of health care, mm -hmm. uh, large numbers of essential workers, mm -hmm. and a host of other issues that continue to plague our community. Right. For those that may be unfamiliar with the term wellness, can you please just touch on what that means and why it's important? Sure. A lot of times people, when they hear wellness, they just mean, think it means absence of disease. And that's not the case. Wellness is optimization of all of these, like I would say probably seven or eight domains of health. Physical wellness, mental wellness, spiritual wellness, emotional wellness, relational wellness, financial wellness sexual wellness, okay? We gotta be honest Absolutely. with all of that stuff. Absolutely. Spiritual wellness. All of those domains can be impaired by access and facilitated by equitable access. And what we know in the space of public health, there's something called the social determinants of health. The uh, factors where you are born, grow, live, work, play, pray, and age that influence 80% of your health outcomes. And we have to look at all those social determinants in order for each of us to achieve optimal wellness. Wonderful, wonderful. That's that's important that we, so just from my understanding, it's important that we have the full circle. It's not just one thing, spiritual. Absolutely, spiritual. absolutely. They work, and so in, in college, most, a lot of us had to take physics, right? And you learned about systems. I'm big into systems. So systems either work in parallel or they work in series, right? Parallel means you do you, I do me, we run together, but what you do does not affect me. When you work in series, what you do affects directly what I can do. And it's the same thing with wellness. If spiritually you're not well, emotionally then you become unwell. If emotionally you become unwell, then physically you become unwell. When you become physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally unwell, guess what? Now your money's looking funny and you're financially unwell. If you're financially unwell, then it can affect all those other factors. So it's all interconnected. And it's very important that we all appreciate that so that one, we make sure we optimize our wellness and we are sensitive to how that impacts everyone else. Mm. Powerful, powerful. Now, uh, before we started this uh, recording, I kind of overheard you talking to your, your it sounded like your daughter. Um, what is it like being a mother during the pandemic? Yeah, so being a mother is like my most favorite job. Like if I, if I did nothing else for the rest of my life, um, she is my greatest accomplishment. I, you know, I laugh because I say that I'm a one and doneer. I have one child um, and she is my joy. She is my why. It has been interesting being a physician and being a mother in the middle of a public health crisis, a pandemic, and also being a public health practitioner, um, from a mother's standpoint, it has been challenging trying to balance between the demands of her being at home with me and balancing the need to 
pre be present. She's an only child, and so I am her playmate. When the weather was acting right, I was with her at recess and lunchtime play. We created something called Swing Dodge. I put a, installed a swing out on the tree in front of my front yard, and I'd throw a dodgeball at her as she swung around. And I we incorporated, based on her suggestion, math. So if I hit her arm, it was 20 points. If I hit her chest, it was like 30 points, et cetera, et cetera. And then she'd have to add up the points. Once I reached 600, I'd get my turn, which never happened because her math was funny. But being able to balance between work is like a pendulum. Yeah. Sometimes I was fully present for her. And sometimes it required me to be fully present for my patients and other demands of my job. Um, and so that really, for me, has been the most stressful part. But the biggest joy has also been her being at home and being able to uh, be more integrated in terms of what she does and being purposeful in my relationship with her. Simply because we share the same space together does not mean that we're necessarily getting quality time. And it goes back to that relational wellness, right? Mm -hmm. And this goes for me and my daughter. It goes for significant others because especially during the stay at home order, we were in each other's faces we still didn't do the things that that put love on each other. And so although we're sitting next to each other, she got her computer, I got mine, I also set aside time where we had pajama jammy jam, movie night, or we went out when we could to explore the beauty of the DMV. I had to be purposeful so that I did not take for granted the fact that we were always together. Wow, wow. You, you said a whole lot. I, I, I wish I had more time to just unpack what you said. Um, but I, I kind of just want to touch on the fact that, you know, you emphasize creating intentional time with your daughter. Yeah. And I think that's something that we all can kind of just take a little piece out of, especially as we kind of find more time, so to speak, in our lives. We can definitely make time for our family. Definitely. Absolutely. So other than the big three, wash your hands, social distance and wear a mask. Mm -hmm. What are some things people can do to mediate the, during this pandemic? I think the first and most important is optimizing your health. Not enough conversation has been had around nutrition, the role that nutrition has not only in maintaining a healthy immune system to perhaps protect against getting the COVID-19 infection, but also to mitigate the risk of severity and death from COVID. We should be talking about using food as medicine, making sure that we're getting in vitamin A, B, C, E, D, E, zinc, uh, looking at elderberry and echinacea in terms of uh, maximizing our health. I hear myself talk about it a lot, but I don't hear it in mainstream media. I don't see it a lot in social media. I try to push it out as much as I can. The second is making sure we're controlling chronic diseases. A lot of times in these stressful spaces, we're not managing our diabetes, high blood pressure, or our weight because we're so focused on our Zoom meetings, getting our work goals done, making sure our children get their assignments turned in, making sure our seniors are fed, making sure our money is still right as things start to shut down. All this stress can negate our focus on ourselves and making sure that those disease processes are well controlled. And I know a good number of people because they come to see me that have gained a quarantine 15, a quarantine 50. And as we go into Christmas and New Year's, holiday times on average, people gain around 10 pounds. So mm -hmm. add on top of that COVID stress, you're talking a good 20. Weight, obesity, and overweight are risk factors for COVID-19 severity and COVID-19 death. So it's those things that we have to really pay attention to so that if and when we come into contact with the cooties, we're able to get through it without having severe illness. Wow. Yes. Yes. That's very, very insightful. Very, very good tips. I'm I'm going to actually probably record this and rewind it, rewind it just to hear you, you know, break that down because those are important things that we should not only practice ourselves, but like you said, mm -hmm. share it with our family members and the ones that we love. Absolutely. Um, speaking of families, what are some common ways that you have seen families affected during this pandemic? One of the biggest and most heartbreaking way, ways that they've been impacted is just the level of loss. And particularly for African-Americans, we know that one in three Black people has a loved one who has died from COVID-19 compared to less than 10% of whites who've lost a loved one to COVID-19. So even if we're not infected with COVID, we're impacted 
by COVID, just by the sheer loss that we as a people are experiencing. We die at three and a half times the rate of whites when it comes to COVID-19. And we only make up 13% of the population, but close to 40% of the deaths. And so just based on percentages and proportions, you know that we are feeling it harder. So we're losing our mothers, our fathers, our grandparents. There's a young man, uh, Justin, out of um, Georgia, who lost both of his parents this past summer to COVID within four days of each other at 17 years old. And so I think through the family members that I've lost, just this week, I've gotten three text messages or phone calls from close friends of mine who've lost uncles, mothers, et cetera. And so the loss that we've experienced and our inability to grieve in the way that we usually do. You know, Black folks, we come together, we have a repast, we have the chicken and stuff that usually has killed the loved one we are mourning. We can't do that anymore. It's a Zoom funeral. And we are an interconnected people, not to say that others aren't, but we are so strongly linked into our community ties that when one of our family members dies, it's a celebration of, of them and reunion for us. And we're losing our traditional ways in which we can say goodbye to our loved ones. So it's a double whammy. And then our children are disproportionately impacted because the majority of children who are dying from COVID are also black and brown children. And so for me, the biggest most heartbreaking is the level of loss that we as black people have experienced. Powerful, powerful message. And I, I mean, I'm sure our listeners can can hear your passion and hear hear the message that you're trying to push out, or yeah. at least at least I hope they can. Um, as a pediatrician, what is the biggest challenge that you've had to face during COVID-19 and how have you faced it? For me as a pediatrician, really as a healthcare professional, the biggest challenge is watch, watching, and, and I try to avoid political conversations, but it's watching the mismanagement of the pandemic. I wear both a public health hat and a physician hat, right? And because of the mismanagement of the pandemic by the federal administration, it impacts my colleagues on the front lines. Like I'm on the front lines in the periphery. I did house calls to keep my patients out of the emergency department. I did those visits to minimize everyone's risk. It was a risk to me, but minimize the risk to my families. But for my ER colleagues, my ICU colleagues, who are now expected to show up for work with COVID-19, yeah. testing positive for COVID-19, as long as they are asymptomatic, they can still show up for work, but have to quarantine and stay at home. So it impacts my colleagues directly, and I'm seeing them dying because of COVID-19. And then for children in particular, it was hard for little ones to be able to get tested. Kudos to Children's National Medical Systems from which I worked and developed my career as a pediatrician. They stepped up and created at one point the only space where children could get tested. And we know that children as much are as much vectors for COVID-19 as grown-ups are. And for them to be able to get tested, to know what their status is, so as to protect their mothers, their fathers, and their grandparents. For me, that's been one of the biggest challenges is knowing that. And then, as I mentioned before, the disproportionality, the disparity that exists in terms of over 75% of children of color being those who have COVID-19 and nearly 80% of those who've died from COVID-19 being black and brown children. And the biggest risk factor is the kind of work their mommies and daddies do. That speaks mm. to one, our role as people of color continuously saving this country and two, the risk we put ourselves in and what people put us in risk for in terms of showing up and showing out to keep this country running. Mm, absolutely. Yes, that's that's deep, man. It goes, it's like you said, it's all connected. Mm -hmm. um, the black community specifically yeah. has had a history of mistrust, not just from the government side, but public health officials mm -hmm. dating all the way back to the Tuskegee experiments. Right. What can we do or what can be done to help bridge that gap and to reform these relationships between the black community and the public relations and the public health space, right. especially as it relates to the vaccine and right. what's going on in the news today? Well, to be honest with you, Mr. Snow, I think it's it starts with an acknowledgement, which is what you just did. It's an acknowledgement of one, why we feel the way we feel and historically, what, how was it birthed, right? It's because Tuskegee, Tuskegee isn't the only example. When you think about the historical context of medicine, 
something like obstetrics and gynecology, where the founding father of, of obstetrics and gynecology, he was the founding father because he abused and used black bodies. He did experiments on women who were enslaved without consent, without anesthesia, right? And we, we look all the way through into the 1970s, something called the Mississippi appendectomy, where black and brown women, without their consent, were forced to have hysterectomies when they were under anesthesia without their knowledge or consent. It wasn't until after people like Fannie Lou Hamer came out of anesthesia from having an ovarian cyst removed that she found out that her entire reproductive system was removed without her consent. So it isn't just Tuskegee. This is the foundation upon which medicine in this country was built, was based on using and abusing our bodies. So it's one, the acknowledgement, and two, the cultural competency on our side as public health professionals, as physicians, as nurse practitioners, as physician assistants, it's our responsibility, not the responsibility of the black, com the black community to feel comfortable. It's our responsibility as public health professionals, as scientists, and as clinicians to reach out to, connect with the black community, hear from us, find out yesterday what was done to make us mistrust the system because it's happening every single day. Every single day, just in the midst of this pandemic, black patients were refused care, refused admission for COVID, refused testing for COVID. Let's have those conversations before you start trying to convince me that I should get this vaccine. And it's not that I'm against the vaccine. I'm not an anti-vaxxer by any stretch of the imagination, but you have to have these conversations in order for us to feel comfortable knowing that you are part of this team with us in terms of optimizing our health. And it isn't until that happens that I can say to my people, trust the system because the system is broken. It needs to be fixed and it is the responsibility of the system with insights and input from the community to fix itself. Thank you for your honesty and your transparency on that answer. Thank I you. really do appreciate that. Um, now, as we look into 2021, um, in your opinion, what is the best case scenario for COVID-19? Best case scenario is, as my grandmother would say, everybody gets them some act right and they wear their masks, they socially distance, they maintain their COVID circles, don't go wilding out and by going here, there and everywhere. And if and when you cannot wear your mask, when you cannot socially distance or you break the circle, you go get tested. So I want folks to put mask up and I want there to be equitable access to testing. You don't know that you are a risk factor for other people without knowing what your status is. I get tested on a regular basis because I'm at rallies, I'm at protests, I'm seeing patients. I do every once in a while break the COVID circle because I have to see patients. That's part of my job. But part of my job is also to protect my loved ones, which is why I get tested. And again, it goes back to access. There has to be equitable access so that without concern about ability to pay, people can be tested and know their status. That's what made the difference in New Zealand, Australia, South Korea, all of those countries. So when Biden and Harris come into office, my prayer, my hope, my, my expectation is that all of those measures will be in place for those things to be achieved. Absolutely. That's well said. Well said. Thank you. Now, uh, part of the Greater Washington Urban League's mission of the Contact Tracing Awareness Program is to uh, inform the community on contact tracing. Mm -hmm. What are some ways that people can benefit from contact tracing to help prevent the spread of COVID-19? That's an excellent exam um, question, and I really commend you guys for making that a priority in terms of your COVID-19 response. A lot of people are leery about contact tracing. They feel like it's big brother all up in their business. And this is nothing new. In my line of work, because I deal with adolescents, contact tracing has been something I've been doing for almost 20 years when it comes to sexually transmitted infections. Once you come in with the cootie, I need to know who you've been around so that they can go get tested so we don't end up having horrible spread of all the, you know, all the stuff, like gonorrhea, chlamydia, et cetera. So a precedent has already been set when it comes to sexually transmitted infections around contact tracing. The role of contact tracing is to make sure that you are an informed community member, to know that if and when you came into contact with someone with COVID-19 that you may not have even been aware of, that you can get yourself tested, get yourself 
treated in terms of either vitamins and all of those things, or if you need clinical care, but it's also to protect your loved ones so you do not become a super spreader. A perfect example, in, at Martha's Vineyard in August, a wedding of 75 members ended up resulting in over 100 people contracting COVID-19 and over 10 people dying. And the people who died were not in attendance at the wedding. These were community members nearby that contracted COVID from like first and second and third person removed. It was because of a lack of contact tracing that they were not able to mitigate, mitigate the spread. Contact tracing facilitates us preventing spread like wildfire of COVID-19. And it, it certainly and simply provides communication and transparency so that you know your risk, period. It's not to get in your mix, not to get all up in your phone, but to truly protect you and the greater good of community. Just like that. Just like, Just that. like that. I love that. Um, now, one thing that I, I want to know, I know that, you know, obviously you're a, a public health professional and you you have a, not, a lot of knowledge that people may not really have access to. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just curious, what are some facts about COVID-19 that people should know that maybe most people aren't, aren't aware of? One of the facts that I really want people to pay attention to, we know that COVID-19 is transmitted through respiratory droplets, right? It's when you and I talk and I spray a little spittle because I get all excited and those respiratory droplets start flying and it hits your lip, might even hit your eyes and you're like, ooh, Hancock, control your spittles. But there's also the aerosolization of COVID-19, the tiny microscopic virus that travels through the air, through air ducts and HVAC systems, which is why we're seeing uh, prior to them shutting restaurants down while we were seeing cases of COVID coming out of indoor restaurant dining. Um, that's something that people should be aware of. It's one of the main reasons why wearing a mask is so critically important because you can socially distance all you want. Respiratory droplets travel between three and 20 feet with the average being six. But aerosolization of COVID travels all over the place, which is why it's important to wear a mask. That's number one. Number two, wearing your mask is critically important, not just for yourself, but for everyone else. Mask wearing does not trap carbon dioxide. Mask wearing does not block oxygen exchange. Mask wearing does not impair your immune system. You're gonna find a lot of different people with a lot of different theories that they're pulling out of their you know wheres that I, I'm gonna keep it clean, cause this is the urban league, but y'all know what I'm talking about. So that's number two. Be careful of these myths that you get around mask wearing. The third thing that people really should pay attention to is the sources of information. There are even physicians like myself, people with MDs and PhDs, that because they have an opinion about things, but not able to back it up with evidence-based peer-reviewed facts, you assume that they know what they're talking about because they have a doctor in front of their names. I always tell people, vet who you're listening to. I am Dr. Yolanda Hancock. I have been a physician for over 20 years. I have a master's of public health from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. I have been in the public health space for over 15 years. That's why I can speak with authority on these issues, but I'm not gonna speak about the economy. I'll tell you that mask wearing can improve the economy because we keep things open longer. So that would be the third thing because people assume that people like myself with a doctorate they speak with authority, they know what they're talking about. But then you find out he's a radiologist with no background in public health, no background in infectious diseases. I wouldn't sit here with infectious disease expertise, even though I've had training in it. My lane is public health and general medicine, particularly related to health, wellness, and pediatrics. Mm. Yes, S stick to what you know. Stick that. to what you know and stay in your lane. Stay in your lane, That's, that needs to be a t-shirt. It really should. Now, um, before we we wrap up today, uh, I just want to know what's your what's your one overall message to our audience as it relates to COVID nineteen. You already know, Mr. Snow. Hashtag mask it up. It was done and said no better than my brother Brian Williams, the founder of Step Africa. They, um, in, with a little expertise and insights from me, just pushed out an amazing PSA with a go-go swang to it. We are highlighting all of the amazing spots in D.C. as we encourage people in a very 
awesome and culturally engaging way to practice what we call hashtag safe life scenario. Mask up, COVID down. Mm. Mask up, COVID down. I love it. I love it. Yes. And if you guys haven't checked her promo for the Step Up Africa, man, y'all missing out. Yes. Go to stepafrica.org. Step A F R I K A dot org. You will see it there. It's also on YouTube. Hashtag Mask Up DC. Even the the mayor, Mayor Bowser, tweeted it out, and it was featured on WUSA 9 News just yesterday. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, as we close out, um, again, I just want to thank you for taking the time to speak with our audience and the people at WPGC. Um, I also just wanted to, to say, if you could, just share with us where people can go to contact you online if they want to get in touch. Absolutely. On social media, you can find me at Ask Dr. Yola. My website is also askdryola.com. On LinkedIn and Facebook, I use my good government name, Dr. Yolanda Hancock. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Dr. Yola, again, thank you a thousand times for taking the time to speak with us, and I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you, my love. I so appreciate you. Have a blessed holiday season. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of the Black 